Arguably, the Gospel of Mark is the pivotal work in the debate over the historicity or otherwise of Jesus. It's the earliest Gospel that we have, and the other Gospels, particularly the Synoptics but also John, are obviously highly dependent on Mark or sources common with Mark. If we find that Mark actually looks more like an attempt to historicise a myth than it does an attempt to record a history, then corroborative evidence from other Gospels is going to find it very difficult to displace that position because of Mark's primacy. And similarly, if we find Mark looks more like an embellished history. Which is why Mark, more than any other Gospel, becomes the focal point in this debate. And it is a debate between two secularist camps – both of which agree that a large majority of the content of Mark is mythical accretion. Hence, the distinction between mostly myth and nearly all myth doesn't really matter. The distinction that matters is that between nearly all myth and all myth. Therefore, expanding on the mythical aspects and pointing out more things that don't look like history are not of great concern. These include things like the genre of the gospel, miracles, borrowing from other ancient writers, and literary structures like ring cycles. None of these look anything like history, but they have little determinative value in the debate. What is concern are the few things that look either like history or like an attempt to historicise a prior myth. These turn on a small number of arguments addressing matters on which the two camps disagree. I've made 16 videos on the Gospel of Mark, one for each of the 16 chapters. In them I read the chapter in the New English Translation and I intersperse some of my own comments, some but not all of which are related to the historicity versus mythicism question. The matter I'll take further here is that of historicising details. I'm doing it separately from my main commentary because the issue spans more than one chapter. Mark includes a few details that do not seem required by his narrative. There is some subjectivity in what you count as such a detail, but I have extracted 11 instances, and these fall into two categories. Recounted events without names and details, where the events don't seem to advance the narrative, and names and details of participants in the story, where those details don't seem to advance the narrative. Taking the events first, there are two, and they are both together in the arrest scene at Gethsemane of chapter 14. Cutting off the high priest's slave's ear, and the young man escaping naked, leaving his linen cloth behind. Neither of these events involve miracles, and we don't know what Mark meant by them. He may have included them in his narrative because they happened, rather than because he wanted to illustrate some particular point. But even if we don't know exactly what Mark meant by these details, they both look symbolic. Cutting off the slave's ear may symbolise shutting down transmission of the message of the gospel to those under the high priest's control. And of the young man's linen cloth, this may symbolise a dualistic idea of soul and body. Joseph of Arimathea later buys a linen cloth to wrap Jesus' body. The escape of the young man naked may be meant to symbolise the spirit of Jesus passing free and unencumbered into the next realm. John's Gospel even tells us the linen cloth is left in the tomb, but this is not in the synoptics. So, while these are believable events, they look symbolic and as though Mark included them for that reason. The second group is these names and places. In Mark 1 verse 11, the third and fourth disciples, James and John, are called, and we are told their father's name, Zebedee. Then, in Mark 2.14, Levi the tax collector is called as a disciple. His father is Alphaeus. Levi is the disciple who never makes it into the list of them Mark gives in chapter 3, and in that list there's a couple more such details. Verse 17, James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James, to whom he gave the names Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder. And in verse 18, another James, this time the son of Alphaeus, and Simon is a Canaanite. In chapter 6, 3, we've got the list of Jesus' family members. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, Joseph, Joseph and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? In chapter 10, verse 46, we have Bartimaeus of Jericho, the son of Timaeus, who was cured of blindness. In 14, 3, we've got Simon the leper of Bethany, 
In 1521, Simon of Cyrene, who came in from the country and was father to Alexandra and Rufus. In 1540, there are the women watching the crucifixion from afar. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Less and Joseph and Salome. Incidentally, the similarity between this Mary and Jesus' mother, coupled with Mark's failure to call her Jesus' mother here, is suspicious. Finally, in 1523, is Joseph of Arimathea. These details do not seem required by the narrative and look historical. We have other reasons to believe that the names were real because of the onomastic argument on which I have done a video. Both arguments point to these being real historical people, and I think that is the balance of probability. The question is, why are they in Mark? One possible reason is to distinguish between people with the same name, such as Simon the leper, Simon of Cyrene, Simon the brother of Jesus, and Simon the disciple, who is a Canaanite. We've got James the son of Zebedee, James the son of Alphaeus, and James the brother of Jesus, and perhaps another James called James the Less from Mark 1540. On the other hand, we've got Joseph of Arimathea, Bartimaeus of Jericho, son of Timaeus, and Levi, son of Alphaeus, all of whom are names that only appear once, and so there is no need for qualifiers to distinguish between them. Those names that do require qualifiers seem historicising, even if that is the reason for including the qualifier. Because wouldn't a storyteller simply pick another name to avoid the confusion? The simplest explanation for the inclusion of these names and geographical details seems to be that they were real people, and the reason for their inclusion could be that the events that they are associated with were originally recounted by those individuals. Obviously Bartimaeus was not cured of blindness, but the simplest explanation for him being in the story seems to be that he had some interaction with either a Jesus or some Jesus prototype, and he told the story widely, a story that evolved into curing blindness. Similarly with the other details, that seems to be the simplest explanation, and so these details do tend to favour historicity. But that isn't the only explanation. There are other explanations that would allow these individuals to be real historical people, but not Jesus. One of these is that the Jesus character was a montage of snippets that originated with different holy men, specifically people like John the Baptist, maybe Caiaphas, and possibly the Essene teacher of righteousness. Two further possible origins of these names require an increasing degree of cynical deception on the part of the writer of Mark. Firstly, they could have been included for political reasons. Mark may have wanted to recruit support from different families or groups to whom these various people were important, and he included them in his gospel in order to get buy-in from those groups. The final and most cynical possibility is that Mark included them entirely falsely with the specific purpose of making his gospel look historical and for no other reason. I imagine these last two will be more favoured by the mythicist end of the spectrum, not so much because they support mythicism, though they do, but because that end of the spectrum is generally more willing to impute base motives to early Christians. They are not wrong to do so because base motives are ubiquitous in history. It's simply a fact that both historicists and apologists tend to assume early Christians are innocent until proven guilty.